Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration today comes from our gospel, John chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what does it take to draw a crowd? Well, usually to have that happen, or a lot of times, you have to be willing to do something that nobody else can do. You have to be willing or capable of doing something that other people refuse to do. I remember a few years ago, we took one of our Project Timothy groups to Venice Beach. And, of course, there were street performers. And there was a gentleman there who was promising to put on a good show. And he was drumming up interest, and he kept teasing it for about 20 minutes until finally this large mass of people was gathered around him until he started the show. He proceeded to take a five-gallon bucket and empty shards of broken glass onto this tarp. Then he took off his shoes and in bare feet stepped on the broken glass to the, the horror and amazement of all gathered around. Then he decided to sit down on the broken glass. And you know, this was legit broken bottles. And then he even had no shirt on laying down on his back and had somebody stand on his chest. Your question that's going through your mind is probably the same one I asked. Why in the world would you do such a stupid thing? Well, for this man, it was for the entertainment value. It was for the money that he collected from the crowd. And I'm sure the number one reason was in the hopes that one day that story would make it into some guy's sermon on a Sunday morning. But you know, we, the people will do these things to gather a crowd around themselves for different reasons. Well, in our lesson, Jesus was gathering a crowd around himself. And some people accused him of being nothing more than an entertainer, a sleight-of-hand artist. Other people looked at his miracles that he was performing and excused them away by some rational reason. But Jesus had another purpose in mind. He wanted to gather a crowd around him because he had the thing that they needed desperately. He had the words of eternal life. He had salvation for their souls and he was the only one who would be able to meet their spiritual needs. He wanted them to be dependent on him for those spiritual needs. Now if you think back to last week, we heard Jesus and his disciples had been busy working. The crowds were so hectic that it was necessary for them to seek a solitary place to get some rest from all the, the work, the hustle and bustle that they were doing, but also to spend some quiet time with their Savior. This morning we find them going by themselves on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, going up a mountain for Jesus to give his disciples some individual instruction. But that peace that they had, that rest that they had, was soon shattered. Our lesson tells us this morning. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him and the rest of the disciples, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. They had headed over to a village near Bes called Bethsaida, but they were even removed from there. And Jesus sees a logistical problem, a logistical need. All of these people are coming out, going far away. And if, since it was kind of a spur-of-the-moment crowd, they hadn't packed a, a sack lunch. At least most of them. And so Jesus says, we need to be able to give them something to eat. And, and he poses this question early. To get those disciples to think about it. To say, okay, what's, what's going to happen here? We are, we're out in the middle of nowhere. There's thousands of people here. How are we going to take care of things? And then we see, as they're considering this question, Jesus welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. 
and healed those who needed healing. He spoke to this crowd about the kingdom of God to tell them the kingdom of God was right there among them. The kingdom of God is what God expects from them and what he has done for them in Jesus. He wanted them to see that dependent on him in faith, heaven was theirs already. Jesus saw this spiritual need and as those disciples mulled over the logistical problem of giving this crowd bread, Jesus made sure to feed the crowd what they needed spiritually. This was really the first feeding to go on this day. Those souls who had come, some for the right reasons, some for the wrong reasons. This crowd that had gained momentum as it went from village to village until finally this massive throng had found Jesus on this mountainside. Jesus saw the need in each one of their hearts and began to feed them. But there was going to be another feeding going on that day. Yes, a physical one, but one that was going to be for the spiritual benefit of the people and the spiritual benefit of the disciples. Now think of the question that Jesus had posed to them. Where are we going to get bread for these people to eat? And Philip, the first one to respond, says, you know what, I've been doing the math, Jesus. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite, let alone to satisfy them completely. Literally, he's saying, Jesus, your heart is much bigger than our pocketbook. We can't afford to feed all these people. You've got to come up with a different solution. And so if we go to the book of Matthew, we see that others came up with a different solution. And it's a simple, rational solution. They say, Jesus, what you do is just send them away. Let them fend for themselves. There are villages nearby. They can go get food for themselves to eat. We don't need to feed them. <clears throat> but Jesus wasn't having any, any of that. He wasn't going to be trapped with their logical reasoning of we need more money to pay for the bread to feed them. He wasn't going to let it suffice to send them away. He tells them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. So the disciples are 0 for 2 to Jesus' little challenge. You see, they had a problem. The disciples were stuck in their rational reasoning and could not see beyond that. And so Jesus is going to push them. Jesus is going to challenge them. Jesus wants them to stretch their faith a little bit rather than to look at what they can see simply with their eyes. And so now another solution comes to hand. Andrew says to him, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? You know, the solution was almost laughable, wasn't it? Here they have this Everest of a problem and you have one little boy's sack lunch. Oh sure, that's going to feed them all. <coughs> if a half a year's wages isn't going to cover it, five measly fish and two, excuse me, five measly loaves and two tiny fish aren't going to do it either. What do you see is the problem here? The disciples were trapped, weren't they? They were trapped in what we say in today's terms in not being able to think outside the box. They were trapped in their own human reasoning and saying, you know what, the only logical solutions here are what we can see with our eyes. The only logical solution here, Jesus, is just to send the people away. Their solution is what we say in our household. Tonight's supper is MYO's. Make your own. Fend for yourself, because we're not cooking. Well, the disciples, they show a little glimmer with Andrew saying, here's, here's a boy who has something. But then you see that solution end in despair. How far will this little lunch go for among thousands? We ever do the same thing? We ever bump our heads on our own human reasoning? Do we ever bump our heads on our own self-sufficiency, our own self-dependency? 
We do all the time, don't we? Because we can only see with our eyes so often and, and see the, the rational solutions that are before us. And so we find ourselves bowing at the altar of modern medicine and what doctors can offer us when it comes to our health. We, <coughs> we find ourselves only looking at the solutions that make sense to us. Think about that when it comes to our relationships with other people and we say, you know what? I got to lie to that person because that, that person couldn't handle the truth if I gave it to them. And so we lie to ourselves and say, well, I'm just simply sparing that person's feelings rather than being honest. Or you know what? We need to go along with the peer pressure because I can't afford to sacrifice that friendship if I don't go along with it. Or when it comes to our marriages, we look at it and say, we'll put into that marriage what we judge that other person is putting into it. And if they're not going to put any more into it, I'm not going to put any more into it. You see, we look for these logical solutions, and they make sense to us. But they're self-dependent. They're leaning on ourselves and on nobody else. And we kind of shackle God and say, we don't have room for miracles here because we can only do what we see. We can only rely on what we know in our hearts because we've seen evidence of it. And so we, in a sense, we stifle God's grace. We stifle his blessings. We stifle his miracles and say, God, there's no room for that here in our lives because we've got to take care of the problem. And you're not there for us. We get stuck in that same box that the disciples were stuck in. That dependency on ourselves, that dependency on our own rational reasoning. And if we carry that further, what does that do to our salvation? God, I can't believe in a possible miracle that you would do something for me like you reveal in the Bible. And so it must be up to me. The only per person I can count on in life, and you know the the history for yourself. The only person you can count on is yourself and no others. And so, when it comes to my salvation, do I think that as well? Well, God has to shatter that box of reasoning that we have where we trap ourselves in. To open our eyes and see that our dependency isn't on ourselves because if we do that, we're going to fail every time but rather the dependency that we have on him for our salvation has been taken care of. The dependency that he wants from us is the only way that ends in salvation. And so there's this kind of shift in the paradigm. Normally we're used to standing on our own grit, but now he says, no, I want you to stand in my grace. Because my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is what is the thing that gets you over the line and into heaven. And so with St. Paul, we can say when all of these things come into our lives, when the difficulties come, when the impossibilities come, we can delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when we are weak, then we are strong. You know, you think about the disciples' laughable solution. Five small loaves, two small fish. And yet, that was the first glimmer of their faith expanding. You see, Jesus had waited so late in the day to do anything about it. Yes, he posed the question early to get them thinking, to try and get them to cling on to him all the more. But he wanted every last avenue to be exhausted to say that's not sufficient. Sending them away won't work. Eight months, or excuse me, half a year's wages, it's not going to cut it. But here's a little sack lunch and here's our Savior. And Jesus, you can do something about it. And so he has the people sit down and he takes that little lunch and he starts distributing it to the thousands and not just so that they can have a little taste or a little bite, but so that they were 
eating and were satisfied. And there was more than enough that they collected 12 basketfuls. He started to stretch their faith to see, look at what can be accomplished through me. Something that you couldn't even think of possible, I've now done for you. He gave thanks for what God had provided. And he fed the people. But there's a deeper spiritual lesson here for not just the disciples and that crowd, but for us. Because we will be faced with those times in our lives where it seems absolutely impossible. With our health, with our safety, with our financial security, with our relationships where we see there is absolutely no way out of here. And yet God just says, depend on me. Believe in me. Put your faith in me. Because I've proven myself in the past. When there seemed to be no way out, look at what I've done for you. I've opened up the storeroom of my blessings and poured out to you, on you abundantly so that your cup overflows. And you look in the mirror, we're not wanting for anything, are we? We have more than enough because God continues to bless us. Not only physically, but spiritually. You know, it's only when we realize just how weak we are, just how incapable we are of coming up with a solution on our own, that we see the Lord of life simply pours out his love on us abundantly in so many ways. He does the impossible, doesn't he? Go back through your life and you can see where God has interacted with you, where he has done something that you say, there's no way possible this could happen. Think of that near miss on the highway. Think of that month where the finances were coming up short yet again. Think of where the, the doctor's bills were rolling in and you're going, man, how am I ever going to pay for this? And then suddenly they're canceled out for whatever reason. God does the impossible for us. Even as we gather here as fellow Christians at Living Hope, you ever see his hand doing the impossible? Think about this last fiscal year. We were projecting to be thousands of dollars short, and where did we end up? With more than enough to carry on ministry. God does the impossible. And he wants us to continue to look to him. Some people draw crowds for entertainment. Some do it for making money. But what does Jesus do? He draws us to himself so that we are dependent on him for everything. We pray, the eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give your gifts at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Think about how he satisfies you in his word. Because every time you look at that little sin that continues to hamper and hinder, the one that is like that blinking light on your dashboard that is so annoying and reminding you of that past guilt, he says, no, that's been forgiven. All those times when we look to ourselves and we've fallen flat on our face for our, in our dependency on ourselves, he says, no, I've taken care of that. You are dependent on me. Go back to Calvary and see the forgiveness won for you there. Go back to Calvary and see that blood poured out for you. Be reminded of that dependency that you have on him every time you come to the altar. Receive the Lord's body and blood. Jesus draws us to himself so that we are dependent on him and he gives us more than we need. And then... He says, I want you to turn that around. Look at the generosity that I've shown to you and be generous to others. God, help us to be generous with the blessings he has given us. Amen. Please stand.